Okay, so well, firstly, thank you to the SGA Network Secretariat for inviting me to, to give this webinar today. Um, so I'm going to start by giving you a quick background to the toolkit TESSA and then an overview of the TESSA approach, including some details on the methods um, incorporated into the toolkit. I'll then finish by um, showing you briefly some of the impact we've had to date through the pilot studies and other work that we're aware of on um, globally, and then let you know what's coming up in the future in terms of continued development. So as you'll all be aware, ecosystem services have really been in increasing profile at the international level over the past couple of decades. In 2005, there was the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report. In 2010, the TEAB, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. And more recently, the formation of a partnership of countries looking at wealth accounting and including the value of ecosystem services beyond the countries looking at GDP measures. There are a range of tools available for assessment, and I'm sure a number of you are very aware of those. Um, TESSA is one of these tools and is applicable in certain cases where other tools may be useful um, elsewhere. And it's important to consider that these tools often operate at different scales. Um, so there are some tools that are more useful at the local level and others that perhaps can be applied at national and global scales. So the thinking behind TESSA was um, started here in Cambridge in 2009 when a workshop was held as part of a horizon scanning exercise and a number of um, academics from the university and conservation practitioners realized that there was not really a tool out there that was addressing site level issues that could be applied by non-experts and collecting locally relevant data um, useful for local decision making. So the objective of developing TESSA was to deploy, to develop and deploy a rapid assessment tool to understand how conservation of sites that are important for biodiversity can also help to conserve and provide different ecosystem services relative to if that site was perhaps converted to, a, to another state. So some of the key aspects that um, we were thinking about in terms of the development of this tool were to ensure that it could be applied by non-experts. Many of these people are working on the ground in local situations and need to have access to tools. That it could be rapid, so it wouldn't be too intensive, requiring a lot of resources. Also available for people with limited capacity in terms of staff, time and money. That it would be participatory, so involving a lot of local level stakeholders throughout the process, including in the decision making and in the reporting of results. But also that it would be scientifically robust and therefore a reliable method for people to use with confidence. This has been a collaborative process between the partners that you can see highlighted at the top on the slide. It started off with three workshops based in Cambridge in the UK, where we engaged over 50 experts in the idea behind developing this toolkit. We then had 30 external reviewers look at a first draft in 2011, and during the last three years, we've piloted the toolkit at more than 10 sites globally with other partners also implementing it without our direct involvement. We continue to have regular steering committee meetings, which I coordinate, and we are providing technical support to a number of people, including BirdLife partners and others from the network, to help them to apply the toolkit and to get their feedback on the usefulness of it and how we might improve it. So the toolkit itself at the moment is a downloadable document. I will provide the link later on in the slides. And as I said, it guides non-specialists through a selection of accessible and low-cost methods so that people can identify important ecosystem services at a site, evaluate the benefits that people get now, and compare those to the site under an alternative 
land use. So you're probably interested to know how this is different from some of the other tools that are available. Firstly, it focuses very much on primary data collection so that the locally relevant data can be um, gathered and applied. However, it also provides methods if people are unable to collect data in the field that allow people to use existing data and benefits transfer where appropriate. It requires fairly low specialist technical knowledge, um, so there are no GIS programs in there. There is a limited amount of um, computer interaction, but due to the data analysis required, people would need some, some basic Excel and, and mathematical understanding. It's also relevant at the site scale, so this is not a tool for addressing issues across large catchments or regions. It's much more focused on areas such as protected areas, important bird and biodiversity areas, or for instance, community conserved areas. So the scope of the tool covers at the moment five groups of services, global climate regulation, harvested wild goods, which many refer to as non-timber forest products, but this group also includes timber as a harvested wild good. Water-related services, this includes flood protection, water quality, and also the regulation of water provision. Nature-based recreation is covered, and also cultivated goods. So I'll just spend the next few minutes um, going through the steps in the toolkit. There is a flow chart at the beginning of the document and on the side of the slide here we'll work through each of the steps just to give you an idea of what's involved in one of these assessments. So the first objective is to do some preliminary work and I've listed a few of the key bits of information that you might collect at this stage. So that would include understanding and defining your area, defining your objectives and also your audience. And this is very important because the information that you collect will be influenced by what your objective is and who you want to communicate this to. Understanding how your data will fit into policy processes is also an important consideration right at the outset of your um, assessment. So is it possible to identify how your results could be integrated into policy processes or communicated at important meetings or events, perhaps in government or at local level council um, meetings? At this stage, it's also important to understand the local context. Now, many of the people implementing TESSA will be working at the site and may have been working there for many years so probably have a fairly good understanding of things like politics, the social structure, access rights to resources, perhaps also the ecology um, of, of the ecosystem. If people aren't familiar with this, then Tessa suggests that um, time is spent familiarizing with these issues as they will influence what you then go on to decide to, to measure and explore. So talking to people informally is a key part of this assessment, getting that qualitative information and local knowledge. So the second step is then to conduct what we call a rapid appraisal. And this is essentially a scoping assessment, which has a number of um, purposes. So it is um, meant to help identify and engage relevant stakeholders and bring them into the process to enable you to verify the habitats at your site, um, to understand the areas of these habitats, and also the drivers of change. So what is influencing the habitat areas? What are the pressures on biodiversity and on the ecosystems of the site? The second step is within this process is to then um, identify the most important services and to understand who is benefiting from those currently. So that involves a lot of discussion with, with stakeholders, um, perhaps in a workshop setting. 
And also this rapid appraisal allows you to explore possible alternative situations, either land use situations or different ways of managing the site. And to consider what this might mean for both the um, biodiversity of the site, but then also the services that it provides and what that means for people. So this is just an example graph of one of the outputs of a rapid appraisal which we provide in the toolkit as a, as a, as a, um, a two-part sort of questionnaire that people work through. And it essentially just shows very simply what this group um, felt might be the changes from an alternative land use in terms of a number of ecosystem services with some increasing a small amount or a lot and some decreasing a small amount or a lot. So once the rapid appraisal has been completed, um, the next step is then what we call identifying the plausible alternative state. And I'll spend a couple of minutes explaining exactly what this means. So the idea of comparing um, two different states is taken from economic principles. And it's um, not just to look at the gross values or the total value of a site, but to look at the difference in terms of, of ecosystem service values and provision between two different states. This can provide important information on the likely impacts of decisions or different policies in place, so it can therefore inform decisions made about land use. It can also help to identify trade-offs. So these might be trade-offs between biodiversity and ecosystem services, between different ecosystem services being provided under different land use situations, and also between different beneficiaries, depending on which ecosystem services people value or depend on more than others. So I'll just give a couple of examples of what we mean by the idea of having two alternative states. So this little picture here shows that a policy action might be identified. And under scenario A, you would not um, implement that policy action. And on scenario B, you would implement that action. So for example, Without implementing an action at this site, business as usual would probably be oil palm development. Whereas if you applied a policy perhaps to not allow the development to go ahead, then the forest might remain in its natural state. In the second example, this is a, a coastal example where um, perhaps there is unsustainable fishing occurring and a policy action identified and implemented might be to put in place marine protected areas. And what TESA would do would be to look at the various ecosystem services delivered under both of these um, states and compare the two. So just to give you a real example from one of the studies that we did um, in Nepal, the first process here was to get together with some of the local people, including the district forest office, to discuss what the alternative state of their community forest might be. And in this case, they drew on a topographical map to show how the forest was in the past, that is before community forestry was implemented. And this enabled us to then come up with two land cover maps um, the percentages of different land covers are provided here, where essentially the unmanaged state forest has um, a much greater um, proportion of degraded forest and cropland than the community forest, which is predominantly mixed broadleaf forest. So once you've decided what your actual alternative state would be, it's then necessary to locate a physical place where measurements can be taken that are representative of this alternative state. So this diagram here shows an example for a forested mountain where under the alternative state, the forest on the lower slopes is expected to be cleared for agriculture, leaving the forest untouched at the peak. 
And there are two options for actually looking at what the services might be for the area that would be cleared. One option would be to look at the lower slopes where they have already been cleared on that mountain and to take data from the crop cultivation from that area. Or alternatively, to look for another similar mountain that has the same soil, climatic um, situation and topography, and to take data from there and extrapolate it across to the area that you anticipate would become cultivated under your alternative state. So if this is an example from that site in Nepal where the black boundary shows the boundary of Porchoki Forest, which is a community forest. That's our current state, which is also an important bird and biodiversity area. To look at the alternative, which was a combination of degraded forest and agriculture, we undertook surveys outside of the um, IBA in a, in a location that had already been converted to agriculture but also at um, a small area within the IBA, but where there was a lot more degraded forest than in other areas. So that's where the measurements were taken and then extrapolated back up to the land cover um, areas that were shown on the pie charts a couple of slides ago. So the reason for doing this is um, based around the concept that was published in Science in 2002 by Bamford and colleagues. And he gathered information from five studies globally, which allowed them to assess the net present value, the economic value of um, sites under conservation versus those sites under some other conversion. For instance, for instance, conventional logging, shrimp farming, or destructive fishing. And what was interesting in the results was that in each case, the economic value from conserving these sites was greater than the economic value from conversion once these ecosystem services were incorporated into the assessment. So just a second example here, just to, to illustrate a different um, ecosystem. This is a wetland in the southeast of Nepal, and it is a, currently a protected Ramsar site. So it, it has wetland grasses, some forest areas, and is grazed by wild herbivores. The stakeholder participatory, participatory meeting um, decided that the alternative state would be um, unrestricted domestic cattle grazing, which is the, currently the greatest pressure on this reserve. And that would lead to a loss of wetland grasses and a loss of forest habitats that are important for a number of different birds and other species. So in terms of what we actually did, again, similar to the um, forest example, we took measurements at our site of interest of a number of ecosystem services and also then chose a site in the northern buffer zone as our alternative location to take measurements where there was a great deal of cattle grazing. So moving on to step four. Um, so this is where I'll give you some details about the actual methods behind um, TESSA. So there's over 50 methods um, in the toolkit across all these different services. And the preliminary work that you will have done in the rapid appraisal will enable you to make a decision on which methods might be appropriate. And that will also be influenced by which methods people have identified as being important, what resources you have, the time and the staff available. And what will be interesting to present to your audience that you have considered right at the beginning of the assessment. So in this example, the black boxes show the methods that were used, um, which range from secondary data, so that's just using existing lookup tables, to um, participatory approaches, um, semi-structured interviews at the household level, and also looking at water services using a modeling tool, which I will mention shortly. So the methods then enable you to collect data both for your current and for your alternative state. 
So I'm going to give a couple of examples for each of the services in the toolkit. So firstly, looking at carbon stock, which comes under the global climate regulation section. This service, as with all the others, will start with a flow diagram directing you through a series of questions that then allow you to refer to the most appropriate method, depending on your site. Each of these flow diagrams is specific for the service and asks key questions, hopefully allowing you to use the most appropriate method. So for carbon, there's basically two different approaches. One is to use data that's already available, such as the IPCC um, information that has above ground biomass values for different um, habitats in different biomes. Of course, the error on this can be quite large. And you may decide that you would rather use more local existing data that might be available or even to collect your own. So there are methods in the toolkit for not just um, tree-dominated habitats, but also for looking at carbon values in grasslands and wetlands. And this involves essentially sampling your area, doing a number of survey plots, and using the um, information to convert values to a biomass and then to a carbon stock per unit area. In a tree habitat, the standard way to do this is to measure the diameter at breast height of the trees, as this guy is doing here, and then to use what we call allometric equations to convert your diameter at breast height to a biomass for each tree, then to a carbon um, amount, and then those can be averaged over perhaps per hectare. A price can also be added to carbon. There are some guidelines in the toolkit on how to do this, um, but the, the, um, there is no fixed carbon price, so that's quite um, a tricky area, and it's best to use a variety of prices to look at the effect that that has on, on your results. So just flicking through then to um, some of the water services. So similarly, these will each start with a flow diagram, which should help you to um, get directed to the most appropriate methods. With the water services, it's often necessary to have a lot of background information before you actually um, go through the method. So in the toolkit, there's quite a lot of guidance on what sort of information you might need and on how to go about getting that information to help inform you which, um, which services you can assess based on the information you have available. Water quality is another of the water-related services that is assessed, and the toolkit splits um, the sites into essentially wetlands or sloping terrains in order to um, give you some methods to do this. In wetlands, it's quite tricky to do on the ground rapid assessment of water quality. We do have some methods in the toolkit, but not all wetlands will be applicable because it needs to be a fairly simple system in order to apply the methods that we have in TESSA. Water regulation is the third of the water services. Um, and one of the methods to look at this is actually using a modeling tool, which can also be used to look at water quality. And although we've tried to avoid some of these more technical um, methods in the toolkit, we decided that this tool, which is freely available, it's hosted online, and they provide free support and training, that this would be a good method to rapidly look at water provision and quality um, for a site scale assessment. So I won't go into details on Waterworld, but the link is here for you to find out more information. They do provide training courses remotely and also here in the UK and I think in some also in some South American countries. So if you're interested to learn more about that, then please go to their website. So moving on to the harvested wild goods, 
Again, the flowchart will lead you down through to a couple of methods. And there's fewer methods in this section than in, for instance, the, um, the global ca carbon in the water sections, because this predominantly focuses on people getting information from the local users of these resources. So through focus groups, participatory workshops, and also household surveys. So this is an example here of a very simple survey that was done at the household level in Koshi Tapu in the southeast of Nepal, where we asked questions on five different um, harvested wild goods, both for the harvesting within the reserve and also where we were doing the alternative state measurements. So some templates of these questionnaires are provided in the toolkit but it is important to, to realize that these are just templates and they will have to be adapted according to the local context. Cultivated goods is a very similar flowchart because it uses um, very similar methods through collecting information from key informants or through a household survey, perhaps with, with people you know are farming, for example. I will just show one example from the UK here from an area very close to Cambridge called Wiccan Fen. This is a site it, that has old peatlands, um, so some undrained area with very deep peat reserves. And the National Trust is an organisation that wants to restore areas that have turned over to arable farming back into um, fen wetland areas in order to build up the peat again and provide habitat for um, a large number of species. So at this site, they were looking at um, the value of the land in the surrounding area in the yellow here for arable crops versus the value of the land of the restored fen. And to get information on the crops, they actually used existing data so there was a land use survey back from 2008, which showed the proportion of land under different crop types. There was a farm business survey database available for everywhere in the UK, which for this region provided net farm income values per hectare. And they were able to use this information to calculate the total annual net income of the land were it to be used for farming instead of restored to wetland. So in this case, they didn't actually collect any primary data because there was a lot of good data already available. So the final service, just to give you an idea of, is nature-based recreation. And this is also um, focused on questionnaires and asking visitors to a site on their reasons for visiting and also getting some travel cost information from them. So in this case, in order to um, evaluate the value of the site under an alternative state for its nature-based recreation, we ask um, for the stated preference of visitors to determine whether they would return if the site was under some alternative land use. And by looking at the difference in number of visitors and therefore average spend between those who would remain coming to the site and those who wouldn't, we can assess the um, net value of the site for its nature-based recreation. So once the um, methods have been chosen and then the data has been collected on as many of those services as are relevant for the site, there's then the process of analysing and communicating that information. And I won't go into detail on that here, but I've just highlighted some essential things to think about. So as mentioned earlier, be clear on your objective um, at the start of your study. Identify and know your target audience so that the way in which you analyse and present your data will be of interest and of relevance. Consider um, other measures of looking at data that don't just apply the economics. Um, often there are 
many factors that may influence decisions such as number of people affected or unaffected, um, number of people in employment, um, and, and other measures that don't just rely on, on putting an economic value. And also including um, consideration of those services which perhaps haven't been evaluated. TEFSA only covers five or so services. There will be many others that are important to people either locally, nationally or globally. And as you do the assessment, it's quite likely that you'll understand a bit more about the importance of these. So it's important to consider that in, in the report rather than just focusing on producing graphs based tightly around the quantitative data that you've gathered. So as I've said here, don't overlook the importance of including that qualitative information that you've got. So here are just a few examples so you get an idea of what sort of um, results can be generated. Um, so this is just a very simple graph showing above ground carbon stock in tons per hectare for a site currently and under an alternative state. For flood protection value, um, in this case, the comparison was between, this was at Wick and Fen, so the farmland value of flood protection, which was valued at zero, versus the wetland because of its um, storage capacity. And this was based, as I said, on, on data provided that was already available. Here is an output from the Water World model, which produces maps that can um, be produced in a variety of forms. Here it's focused on the important bird area, Pulchoki, just outside of Kathmandu in Nepal. And it shows that agricultural pollution increases the human footprint on water quality as much as 70%. So the areas in red, which are effectively inside the site, were they to be converted to agriculture, would have a huge impact on the quality of the water flowing from that site, but only at fairly local level. So the bluer the rivers become, the less the impact is because those rivers are being diluted by water from elsewhere. So the effect of the pollution is much reduced. And here's another example of a graphic looking at the difference between um, Pulchoki under community forestry and under an unmanaged state where there will be a lot of degradation and visitors saying that they would, um, many of them would not visit and therefore the income per year from visitors would be greatly reduced if the site was converted and was no longer forest. So I just wanted to also highlight um, that the toolkit doesn't just um, recommend the production of graphs, um, graphs on um, aggregate values, but also the importance of considering how those benefits are distributed. So in this example, which is taken from a paper published in 2009, box one shows the service, that's S, and the beneficiaries, B, both located in the same site. So an example of this would be, for instance, harvested wild uh, medicinal herbs where people are living in the forest and getting that benefit directly from where they live. In the second box, the service is being provided by a site to beneficiaries living just outside. So a good example of this would be something like pollination where the habitat for the pollinators is within the forest and they're benefiting people who have crops just outside. In box three, this is a downstream benefit, so most relevant for water services. But for instance, the service could be the ability of the forest to hold on to the soil so that soil erosion is reduced and impacts less on the beneficiaries living downstream. And in the fourth box, this is a directional benefit also to local beneficiaries um, in one direction. So the obvious example here is a coastal protection service, perhaps from some mangroves aligning the shore, preventing storm surges from affecting beneficiaries living and growing crops behind. So the importance of highlighting this is that 
it's important to understand how services are benefiting people, both at the local level, but also nationally and in some cases globally. So in all of our results, we haven't only provided information like this, which shows the net difference in terms of economic value of services between two states, but also information on what that means for beneficiaries. So this second table here shows um, in a quantitative way where negative values mean that that beneficiary group will lose out. Positive symbols mean that they will gain from a change in state. And the equal sign there means that there would be no significant change um, in the service to that beneficiary group. So this hopefully enables um, people to see the overall effect of a decision on the provision of services to different people. So just a second example here is from Montserrat in the Caribbean. This is an island where they're trying to um, limit the impact of feral livestock on the habitat of the Central Hills Reserve, which is just north of the um, exclusion zone where the volcano erupted. And what we showed on, at this site is that Currently, as a protected reserve and with the livestock management program in place, services are being delivered better than they would be delivered if the livestock was no longer being controlled. And just a final study here, Wiccan Fen, that's just up the road here in, in East Anglia in the UK. Again, looking at the difference in terms of the economic um, benefits of farmland versus rest, um, restored Fenland, but also looking at what that means for different groups of people. And in this example, they were looking at the benefits from restoration, showing that locally, nationally and globally, overall, people were benefiting more broadly from the restored site. So um, just to provide perhaps some key information that people are often interested in in terms of um, what's involved in the toolkit. So we would imagine that the direct users of this um, TESA tool would be practitioners working in the field, such as conservation professionals, project managers, technical field officers, and also students. The time required for collecting data, which is based on at 27 sites where we have this information is about 56 person days. So that's about 11 weeks or near, near three months um, for one person. So if you had a team, then this would obviously take less time. And the average field cost is around six and a half thousand dollars. And that is based on data from 19 sites where we have this available. So just to show you um, some of the studies that partners of TESA have been involved with globally, um, I've just highlighted most of the ones that I'm aware of here. So TESA has been applied already in over 20 countries across five continents, most recently at 11 sites in Africa through a training program that we offered last year. And and there's quite a lot of text on this slide, so perhaps you don't need to read it now, but could have a look at a later date. Um, this is an example of some of the impact that TESSA has had um, at different sites. So perhaps just picking up on um, Rara National Park in Nepal, where the information is being used to try and reinstate community forests in the buffer zone to enable more sustainable use and better ownership from local communities of their resources. Um, looking at the role of TESA in helping ecosystem-based adaptation approaches in Burundi in Africa, um, looking at options for alternative crops because of issues around water shortages and also reforestation strategies to um, allow people to have less dependency on crops that are going to um, not be very productive in view of climate change. 
and also in, in Cameroon, looking at um, an area where cocoa plantations are being established, where the results were presented to the local community, and they decided, based on the information on um, water quality and carbon, that they would prefer to explore um, keeping their natural forest and earning um, benefits from that in its natural state, rather than converting it to cocoa. So um, just to summarize then at the end so where we're going next with TESSA. So there is a version available online, but it is a working version because we're constantly trying to improve it based on the feedback that we get from users. So some of the things we'll be adding over the next year or so will be new modules on coastal protection, cultural services, and also pollination. And we're also exploring capacity de development um, activities. So in the last year or so, we've done a number of training workshops, both in Africa and also in, um, in Asia. And these have um, been a great success, training a number of people working in international and national NGOs and in the universities to actually go out and, and use the tool and then come back to us with, with comments and feedback. So this is the link to access TESSA via the BirdLife website. You need to fill in a short registration form and then um, we will send over the toolkit. At the moment, as I said, it's a rather chunky PDF document. Um, don't let that put you off because actually a lot of the content will not be relevant for your site. So you just need to make sure you read the, the methods that are appropriate. And to let you know that hopefully by the end of this year, we will have um, a website up with lots more information, example case studies, um, support, and also a much more easily accessible toolkit um, that's split into different modules with some um, parts of it available offline as well. So please do keep checking back um, as we develop this further. So just leave this slide up perhaps um, so that you can see the resources that are available. I'd just like to acknowledge everybody who's been involved in developing this and also thanks to the Cambridge Cons Conservation Initiative for support. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, I think that was a very useful and clear and insightful presentation. Um, we will now answer a few questions that have come through um, and then we will uh, stay online for a little while in case there is any other questions out in the audience and then we will have a quick wrap up. So the first question that we have received uh, is possibly been answered at the end of the presentation there but we had a question saying is there a manual or book available about the TESSA toolkit? Yes, so um, I've just put this slide back up. So this link will send you to the page where you can register to download the manual. Yeah. Great. And uh, a second part to that question was, um, is it possible for this presentation to be made available for future use? Um, certainly a copy of today's webinar will be available on our SGA network website. Um, however, I'm not Sure, I'll hand over to Jenny to confirm whether or not she's happy to share the copy of her actual PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> yes, I think that will be fine. Uh, some of the um, figures in there are actually in, in papers that are waiting to be reviewed, so I might just have to block out a couple of those for the time being, but it should be fine. Okay, that's great. And a second question. Um, we have received is about the marine ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. uh, has it been, so has TESA been applied to marine ecosystem services uh, derived from sea grasses? Okay, so um, that's, that's a very um, interesting question because we've just been discussing recently um, how to make TESA more applicable to coastal and marine ecosystems. 
At the moment, um, it's only been trialled in one site in Madagascar, which is mangroves rather than seagrasses. And the person that did that looked at um, a number of services from mangroves, including carbon, harvested wild goods. Um, we haven't yet explored how we might be able to look at seagrasses, but that is a potential development for the coming um, year. Okay, great. The questions are coming through thick and fast now. Um, with the next one we have is, how do you merge data from different uh, nature? So qualitative and quantitative yeah. data, so for global assessments of different ecosystem services. Okay. Um, perhaps I'll split that into two parts. So in terms of merging the data that the toolkit will get, um, some of those graphs I showed you did um, compile information where it had been gathered in an economic way. But of course, you may not be gathering economic information for all of the services. So the um, slide that I showed, which had um, the two rose plots, I don't seem to be able to move back to it here. Um, yeah, I'll just whiz back. So this slide here, which shows what are called rose plots, actually puts everything onto a nominal scale with a ratio so that you can compare services which have been measured in, in different ways. So in this case, water quality and provision were not given economic values, um, but we were using this approach, we're able to put them all onto the same scale. So that's how we dealt with the merging issue. Um, and then you mentioned a global assessment. So the toolkit um, is aimed at looking at site scale work, so I'm not sure um, how to answer a question about looking at the global scale, and um, perhaps that's for another presentation. Okay, great. Um, we have one that is asking, how is the TESA toolkit related to Invest or any other software? Okay, so that's a good one. Um, so we do give an overview table in the paper which I provided the um, details of at the end, which talks about um, the how TESA is different from a lot of these other tools out there, including INVEST. So that's this pay at our paper under the publications with the DOI link there. Um, essentially, TESA doesn't require computer software, so INVEST runs through a software system and produces spatial maps. TESA is more an on-the-ground methodology where you go and talk to local communities and gather data, and it doesn't have its main output as maps. So those, I think, are the core differences. I also think they're complementary. So um, a lot of the information that INVEST requires can be obtained through using TESSA. So, for instance, if you want to have tons per hectare values of carbon and you don't want to use lookup tables for that, TESA would allow you to collect local information to then plug in to invest models. So we're actually exploring at the moment um, how, how that complementarity can be realized and perhaps looking at maybe trialing TESA and invest at one site um, to see how they can perhaps work together in some cases. Great, that's uh, very interesting. Um, the next question is, does the toolkit provide new methods for accessing any particular ecosystem service, or does it provide a set of references to existing methods for the user? Okay, so essentially the toolkit draws together standard methods that many people will be familiar with. So that was the reason for involving 50 or so experts on these different services at the beginning. Um, so I would say that the methods are perhaps not new but more adapted so that they are what we consider to be the simplest way of doing something to get good reliable data. Um, so it does provide references in some cases to existing methods. So if we talk about um, doing workshops, we will provide links to 
resources on how to run workshops, how to ensure you're including the right people, how to do good participatory approaches. So we've tried not to rewrite what's already out there, but to provide links where relevant. Great, thank you. And I think here we have one that's maybe linked to the last question somewhat. Um, what do you think about the great number of software and tools that have been developed for assessing ecosystem services? <laughs> it's a very open question. <laughs> um, I think it's good that there are lots of people developing different ways of thinking about ecosystem services. Um, I also think it's good that they focus on different scales. Um, so like I said at the beginning, some of these um, softwares are very good for looking at big catchments or landscapes, others much better at looking at small sites. Um, I guess there could perhaps be a bit more um, communication between these different groups of developers in terms of um, being clear on how they fit together, how they're different, um, and I guess trying not to confuse users with, with which might be appropriate where. So perhaps there does need to be a bit more simplification or, or bringing together of these tools under some sort of um, umbrella so that people can more easily understand um, what they're useful for and how which ones can be used in which circumstance. Great. I think that's a nice summary. Um, we have a couple of questions I think Jenny will be able to possibly answer in sequence here. So can you use the TESA toolkit for monitoring ecosystem services? And then what is the suggested size of the study area for TESA? Okay. Um, I'll do the size one first because that's easier. <laughs> so um, I think I showed very briefly on one of the slides that what we've suggested based on our experience to date is um, anything from, oh, let me check, I think 100 hectares to something like 100,000 hectares. So, um, you know, obviously the bigger the site, if you're just doing surveys in one area, they won't be representative. So if you have a large site, it's probably good to do a number of sub-surveys so that you get a good spread. Um, so in terms of keeping this a rapid tool, that's why we're kind of suggesting keeping the size of your area fairly small. Most of the sites I've done have been in the tens of thousands of hectares, so maybe 20, 30,000 hectares, where it seems to work well. Um, so looking at monitoring, this was one of the original objectives of developing the toolkit. Um, at the moment, it's very much focused on a one-off assessment, but we're very keen to explore how people can use it for monitoring. Some services are easier than others, of course. So for carbon, some of the um, one of the methods, for instance, in forest suggests that you tag the trees so that several years later and periodically after that, you can go back and then measure the tree growth and look at the carbon sequestration over time. For other services, such as harvested wild goods, this would be much more difficult because people might harvest um, different quantities of goods for different reasons over time. They might switch the goods they're harvesting for various issues, climate change, um, one of them. Prices will alter related to um, the economic system. So for services like that, we haven't addressed monitoring yet because of all those complexities. But again, it is something that we're interested to explore. Thank you. And in your last point, you referred to the rapidity of the tool. Uh, so a question related to that is, is it fair to summarize TESA as a type of rapid assessment where data is summarized for decision makers, but largely not numerically quantified? Um, yes, I would partly agree with that. So it is definitely a, a rapid assessment that you might do um, at a site where you see an opportunity perhaps for um, using ecosystem services, um, maybe as an argument for conservation or just to try and get better information into decision making. Um, if you were then going on to think about something like um, RED or payment for ecosystem services, you would need to do a more intensive assessment. So in terms of 
your comment saying, yes, it is rapid, and summarizing first cut information for decision makers, that I would agree with that. Um, with the numerically quantified bit, I, I would disagree because all of the services are quantified at the moment, um, and then some of them in economic terms as well. So it does present numerical data. Great, thank you. We have a couple of, uh, sort of technical questions related to the capabilities of the tool. The first one, does TESA integrate a kind of hydrological modeling to assess water provision and water regulation? And the second one, is TESA useful for assessing ecosystem services of fragmented landscapes such as high nature value farmlands and are there any examples of that? Okay. Um... So looking at the, the hydrological modelling question, um, yes, yeah, so I mentioned Water World being a tool which we refer to in the toolkit. And um, I won't go into all the details because I'm not the expert, but Water World essentially allows you to um, run a scenario on a map where you've pinpointed the area that you want to look at. That might be a protected area. Um, and it allows you to see how that, how the water services of that area might be affected if you tweak perhaps the amount of forest cover or the amount of crop cover or the climate. Um, and it does that by having about, well, several hundred baseline hydrological maps in the background, which it draws upon to provide that information. So you don't need to add any of your own data other than telling the model what you want to compare in terms of your land cover. There will be more details on the website, which I provided the link for, um, which will hopefully explain how that tool works um, in more detail. So looking at um, fragmented landscapes and farmlands, um, so I would say it depends what you wanted to look at. If you were looking at whether fragmentation was an issue, um, you might be able to get some information from using TESA, but I suspect you would also need to do some other scientific work to understand that. Um, if you were just looking at perhaps what the small fragments were able to provide in terms of services, and how that might be different compared to a larger patch. You could potentially use TESA to, to say, a number of things at the first level. Um, there's no examples that I'm aware of where TESA has been used at multiple fragments and then pulled together. Um, it has been used to look at farmlands, but not under that context. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question well enough. But. <laughs> If there's any follow-up to any of these questions, um, please do feel free to send us an email or join the webinar uh, forum discussion after this webinar has finished. Um, so I think we have two final questions here. Um, you mentioned in the journal Ecosystem Services that the toolkit could be developed to use for the purpose of monitoring of changes in provision of ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. Are you going to add some special features to the toolkit? <laughs> Um, yes, quite possibly. So we've got a long list of things that we want to develop, some of which I showed at the end there. Um, it is likely that we will, once we've managed to think a bit more about monitoring and the implications in terms of collecting the data over time, um, that we will then add some more content to TESA to guide people and how they might use it for monitoring. Great. And one final question to wrap up this Q&A session. Uh, would Jenny welcome feedback on the ease of use of the suitability of using TESSA in different sites and contexts? If so, is there a form to complete? <laughs> Absolutely. I would very much welcome feedback. Um, there isn't a form to complete at the moment, but if you register for the toolkit, there is a box that you can tick to say you would be happy to share and the outcome of your study, and that includes any feedback you might have. So um, when you register for the tool, perhaps just make a note 
in the text box um, and then I look forward to, to hearing your, your comments. Great, thank you very much for those answers and indeed for all of your questions.